Good afternoon, everyone. I think we will get started. Thank you so much for joining us for this month's Teach Educational Round. Here with us, we have Huma Taj and Dr. Wayne D. Ruder. But before I hand it off to our presenters, I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping slides as per usual. First of all, if you are interested in obtaining a letter of completion for this month's Teach Educational Round, please make sure that you have registered for this webinar and completed the pre-learning assessment. You have signed in to view this webinar using your first and last name so I can track your participation. And finally, you complete the evaluation and post-learning assessment, which will be emailed to you this afternoon, and you'll have one week to complete that. These webinars are being live tweeted on Twitter, and you can follow us at PSQuitSmoking or use the hashtag TeachWebinar to post or read questions. Here's a biography of our first faculty presenter, Huma Taj. Huma is a social worker at the Big Independence Clinic. Her education Please press the mute button. Thank you. So Huma is a social worker at the Nicotine Dependence Clinic. Her education and experience has been specialized in the mental health and addiction field. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology, a graduate certificate in addictions and mental health, and a Master of Social Work degree. Huma has worked in agencies providing services for community mental health, crisis intervention, harm reduction, family services, and employment assistance programs. And here is a biography of our second faculty presenter, Dr. Wayne DeRuder. Wayne DeRuder graduated from the University of Toronto in 2014 with a PhD in exercise sciences. His dissertation focused on the interrelationship of multiple health behavior change and how changes in one health behavior can lead to changes in additional health behaviors. Currently, Wayne is a research analyst at the Nicotine Dependence Services at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, working on the STOP study. Here's a list of their disclosures, as well as our disclosures. And remember, the content of the TEACH educational rounds are primarily based on evidence-based guidelines from the following sources. These materials, as well as the verbal presentation and any discussions, set out only general principles, and they do not replace the need for individualized clinical treatment plans by healthcare professionals. And before I hand it off to our presenters, I'm just going to do a few polling questions to see who has joined us here today. So in a minute, using your computer, could you please indicate which of the following organizations you work for? And if your organization isn't here, you can always type it in the chat box. Okay. So it looks like we have lots of public health units, hospitals, family health teams, addiction agencies, and other? Okay. And again, using your computer, could you please indicate what your current discipline is? And you might need to scroll down to see all of the options. Oh, and in the chat box, we have some health authorities, child protection, CMHA, welcome. Registered nurses are joining us. Some addiction counselors, awesome. And finally, for our last poll, could you please indicate which region your organization serves? So it looks like we have some out of the province of Ontario, NS, Southwest area, Central East area, Toronto and Greater area, awesome. Okay, so with that, I will leave it to our presenters. Uh, thank you, everyone, and enjoy. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, so I'm Wayne, and Huma's off to the uh, left here, and she'll be coming on very shortly. Uh, so for today, I'm just going to talk very briefly, give you a very brief overview of suicide and substance use and then uh, Huma is going to provide a clinician perspective for the majority of the presentation. So, there we go. So I thought I would open it up to you all and just ask you really, really quickly, what comes to mind when you hear the word suicide? Any thought, feeling, anything? 
giving up, pain, hopelessness, pain again, depression, sadness. Okay, so several people are talking about depression, self-harm, hopelessness, and giving up. That's great. Um, how about anxiety? Does the word anxiety come to your mind as a public health professional dealing with anxiety and a client comes to you and they're saying they're thinking about suicide? Yeah, okay. Great, okay, so some of you do feel anxiety and who is going to talk about that a little bit later on? So suicide, according to the World Health Organization, refers to an intentional act of killing oneself. And suicide is a very, very complex condition. Uh, it usually involves several factors, which may include uh, mental health, substance use, which we're going to talk about today, uh, cognition, social factors. It can also include biological factors as well. Oh, okay. So I have PDF. All right, so we have a problem with this slide, um, but if I can remember it, uh, suicide is a great concern for public health professionals. <clears throat> um, it's just not the fact that somebody has died, but it can also have significant implications as well. And uh, what I was going to show in this slide, and I don't know if you guys can see it or not, but uh, for every one suicide there is, there are five self-harm injuries that require hospitalization for. So for every one suicide, there are five people that have harmed themselves and require hospitalization. Um, for every suicide, there's also 25 to 30 suicidal attempts as well. And seven to 10 people are affected by the suicide loss directly. Now in Canada, there are 11 Canadians who die by suicide each day, which works out to be about 4,000 people who die annually. Suicide is the ninth leading cause of death in Canada, behind Alzheimer's disease and influenza. Now, on a global perspective, there are 800,000 people who die annually. Now, 45% of these people are in China and in India. But if my math works out, uh, that's about one person for every 40 seconds. There's one suicide for every 40 seconds which means roughly by the time this presentation is done, there's going to be about 90 suicides in the world. Now, uh, the suicide rate in Canada is not as high as it used to be back in the late 70s, early 80s. Of course, it's not as low as it was back in the 50s. We've seen an increase in both men and women, but um, it's starting to decrease a little bit as well. Suicide rates are three times higher among men than women. And I'm just going to throw this out here. Does anybody know why? Any thoughts? Okay, yep, men use more lethal means, absolutely, yep. Yep, women get help, that's another one, yep. Uh, it's also men are more aggressive. They tend to be more aggressive than women, and men are more likely to use substance than women are. But these are all great points here. Women can communicate emotion, are able to communicate emotions. That's great. Now, for age groups, uh, suicide is the second or third leading cause of death for children, young, young adults, and adults as well. Now, as people start to age, 45 years and older, there are other conditions that are more common, heart disease, cancer, and that means that suicide is the seventh leading cause of death or 12th leading cause of death for older people. We also see that here is the uh, death rates for suicide per 100,000 people in Canada. The bulk of it is during middle age, so in the 40s and the 50s. Uh, one interesting point, though, is that it starts to increase again at the age of 80. I'm not exactly sure why. I, uh, can anybody provide a suggestion why that might be? And this is not uh, assisted suicide, but it's just suicide. I'm, uh, I'm actually curious about this. Any thoughts? 
loneliness, yep. Declining health, friends gone, yep. That's all good points, yep. Loneliness, great, fantastic. Now, it's not only suicide that's important, but it's the suicide thoughts, plans, and attempts. So in their lifetime, Canadian, there was 12% of Canadians who report some kind of thought or suicidal ideation. 4% uh, of people come up with a specific plan, and 3% of Canadians in their lifetime have a suicidal attempt. And it's suicidal attempt that's very important because not only is it a significant risk factor for suicide, but there seems to be some kind of window between the actual attempt and those who complete the suicide. It's usually within six months of a suicidal attempt and um, actually completing suicide. So that six month window is very important. Uh, it's time for health professionals to act and to really help out the individual who has made a previous uh, suicide attempt. Uh, so again, we're gonna talk about substance use today, which is one of the main factors of uh, suicide. Uh, it's not as big a risk factor as mental health. I think 90% uh, of people who have um, completed suicide in Canada have mental health issues, but it's a, a very large factor nonetheless. And perhaps the most important substance is alcohol consumption. So what we can see here is that those who are diagnosed with an alcohol use disorder uh, usually have a higher risk of ideation, attempts and completed suicide. And for every one liter increase in alcohol consumption within the population, the odds of suicide increases by about 11 to 39 percent. So what can we do about this? Well, there is research that shows that um, policies and um, guidelines have helped to reduce suicide. The guidelines for alcohol consumption have reduced suicide, uh, increasing the minimum age of alcohol consumption, legally buying alcohol, is, has worked good. One thing I found very uh, interesting, though, is uh, Alcoholics Anonymous membership. So for every one person that uh, joins Alcoholics Anonymous per 100,000 people, the risk of suicide actually decreases by 0.2 to 0.3%, which I found very interesting. So um, groups like that can make a significant difference in uh, suicide risk. Uh, opioids are also a risk factor for suicide, and it's not only opioids themselves, but the dose of opioids. And what we see here is a significant dose-response relationship. So as the dose of opioids increases, the risk of suicide increases as well. Uh, cannabis use. So chronic cannabis use is associated with ideation attempts and death by suicide. Uh, we don't really know that much about recreation or acute cannabis use, so there's definitely more research that needs to be done on that. But chronic cannabis use is definitely a factor for And I think what might be interesting in, in a couple of years is to see if the legalization of uh, marijuana here in Canada does have an influence on uh, suicide risk. That might be something to look at later on. And uh, smoking. So current smokers do have an increase in ideation and planning and attempt and also death by suicide. Uh, former smokers, not so much. I mean, they still have a, an association with uh, ideation, but the attempts and death are not significantly associated. So, former, so quitting smoking does appear to look like it helps with uh, suicide attempts and death as well. Now, there are a number of shared factors between substance use and suicide, and the risk factors that are shared are aggressive tendencies, bullying, family conflict, uh, history of abuse, and certain personality characteristics, and of course, as I mentioned before, previous suicide attempts. <clears throat> Protective factors may include trusting relationships, positive outcome, uh, effective problem-solving problem skills, and strong family bonds. So let me pose a question to you all. Uh, do you think society as a whole does enough for suicidal people? And if, if you answer no, why, what, can, what can we do about it? Any suggestions? I see a lot of no's. Uh, therapy, okay. Decrease the stigma, yep. Resources, yep, increase of resources. Medication is another one. 
So with all that being said, and these are some really good answers, uh, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Huma, here, and she's going to provide a clinician perspective of substance use and suicide. So thanks, Wayne. Um, some really interesting stats uh, there regarding suicide. So I'm going to start by asking a few questions um, related to how uh, we all feel as clinicians dealing with suicide. So I want to ask, what are things about overlapping suicide use and suicide, uh, suicide risks that cause you anxiety? Um, so I'd love to hear uh, some thoughts on that and how that anxiety might impact your approach uh, to dealing with a, a person who presents to you with these risks. So people not able to stay safe due to substance use behavior, okay, impulse control. So yes, the impulsivity is one of the things that is increased with substance use. Um, will I say or do the right thing when helping? That's a really big one, absolutely. And low impulse control, right. So it sounds like uh, from what I'm getting here, it seems like a lack of, of control is something that causes anxiety. Um, we're there's a heightened risk and not knowing what to do with it. Um, so things, again, childhood trauma, so things that are kind of outside of your control that, um, you know, we're not quite sure what to do with. And then how would you approach this differently than someone who might not have those overlapping concerns and someone who might present with some suicidal risk but not have the substance use piece to go along with it? Um, how would you approach a client with substance use differently? Length and session time, okay, perfect. So giving that person more time to um, explain what's going on, exploring with the patient um, about their substance use, perfect. Harm reduction approach, fantastic. Identify supports in the community, determining why they're using, perfect. Harm reduction, yes, yeah, okay. Asking to involve a family member or friend, fantastic. That's a really great one. Line of care, perfect. That's great. So you know a lot of a lot of things regarding the substance use. So we're trying to come up with ways to mitigate the harm associated with their substance use in hopes that that'll kind of decrease their risk of suicide overall. Now a lot of these things that people are mentioning, you know, involving family members, doing a comprehensive safety plan, spending a lot of time with that person, all of those things um, are things that we would kind of do with anyone who's suicidal, right? It's not like if someone presents with a suicidal risk that all of a sudden we're going to say, okay, well, you know, you don't have substance use, so I'm just going to do this bare minimum here um, and then send you on your way. We want to do a thorough assessment and an intervention for anyone who presents with suicide risk. And it's really important to figure out what it is about this that causes us anxiety, right? That lack of control over the situation, feeling like we're not equipped to handle that situation, not knowing what to do with the information we do get. So let's say we go ahead and ask about all of this stuff. Um, and the client tells us something, but in the end, we're kind of like, oh, now I don't know what to do with this, with this information. How do I actually approach this? So it's important to kind of recognize that and to accept that anytime anyone presents with, you know, thoughts of harm to themselves, we're going to have some anxiety dealing with it just as human beings. You know, forget the clinician piece, but just as human beings, it makes us uncomfortable to know that someone else is in pain. That's just part of our compassion. And bringing that into our clinical work, I think, is really important because it helps that other person understand that, you know, we care. We genuinely care. We're not just here to do an assessment and to kind of, you know, figure out, like, okay, where are you on this? Are you mild, moderate, or, or severe? And, you know, that's all I need to know. We're actually there saying that I'm concerned about you. This worries me. Um, and I want to do what I can to help. So, and I, and I see someone has kind of posted that in the, in the chat here, too. So we're going to go through a little bit of a case here. Um, so we're going to talk about Jane. Um, now, here's a little information about Jane. So Jane is a 34-year-old female. Um, she has a history of polysubstance use, so things like prescription opiates, uh, injection use, heroin. 
um, and occasional crack use as well. She has a history of binge drinking alcohol, and all of this has been spanning about 17 years. Um, she has two past suicide attempts, um, so these have included cutting her wrist when she was 19 years old, and an overdose on prescription opiates at 30. She continues to have suicidal thoughts, um, and she's been hospitalized a number of times over the years for overdose. It's unclear how many of those overdoses were intentional or accidental. We don't have that information, and she's not quite sure either. So she has a diagnosis of PTSD, borderline personality disorder, and bipolar 1 disorder. History of self-harming, so the cutting has kind of been throughout her, um, you know, throughout the span of her life. And uh, she is connected to a women's health uh, program, and she's had support there on and off for about six years. So when she is doing relatively well with her mental health and uh, in recovery from her substance use, she's more connected, and when she's got more active substance use, she's a little less connected. At the moment, she's been abstinent from substances for about one month. She's living in a shelter, and she's trying to stabilize on medication. So this is a very complex client who has a lot of needs, a lot of things going on. So I'm going to ask a few questions, and I'd love to hear um, what you think about this. So the first question is, is the client at imminent risk? So based on the information we have, um, and I'll just go back to it here, um, is Jane at imminent risk? And if you say either one, yes or no, why or why not? Being a lot of no's. Any thoughts on why? Any any reasons? No defined plan. Need more information. She's in a safe environment. She's not using. She's connected to resources. Okay. She's getting support. She started meds. Okay. Yes. Okay, so someone said yes, still stabilizing on medication, um, but she could slip. Okay, okay. Just abstinent from substances for one month, so a few yeses, a few noes. Okay. She's not settled in the aftercare. Okay, so um, those are all really good points, so things to consider, right? We've all kind of pointed out the risk factors and the protective factors here. So the protective factors being that she is trying to stabilize on medication. She's been abstinent for a while. She's getting support. Um, she's connected to you. Um, so she is getting some support. She's in a place where, you know, she's ready to, to work towards a recovery. But we do still have the risk factors. So um, risk factor being that she has been abstinent for a month, but a month is really not a long time. And we need to question what in her life has changed. So, you know, other than um, you know, her getting some help, what other aspects of her life have changed? Has her PTSD gotten a little better? Um, is her mental health more stable? What are the things that we need to know? So people have also mentioned we need more information. So it's difficult to say whether she's at imminent risk if you don't know um, whether or not she has a plan or intent. And this case doesn't indicate whether or not she currently has a plan or intent. It does indicate that she has thoughts. But we need to assess for that. So we need to ask flat out, you know, um, you know, You've, you've mentioned you're having thoughts of suicide. Have you thought of how um, or when or if you were to act on those thoughts? So we really need to be explicit and ask her. Um, we can't just leave it at, you know, I have thoughts of suicide and, and moving forward. Um, it's our due diligence to kind of assess that. So the, my next question, is she at chronic risk of suicide? So chronic risk. Uh, being, you know, kind of continued. They might not be imminent risk where she is actually actively going to hurt, hurt herself, um, but kind of continued risk where we're not quite sure whether or not it's going to go away. Yes. Okay, the yes is. Chronic risk, working on stabilizing. Great. Past suicides, yes or past suicide attempts, yeah. Great, yeah, so that, that's kind of where I would put her to, is she's kind of at chronic risk. She's had multiple past attempts. Her, her most recent attempt is four years ago, which isn't extremely recent, but it's still fairly recent. Um, and yeah, due to you know her mental health and, and her history of self-harming and her substance use, um, and the fact that she's also used one of her substances of choice as a method of a suicide attempt, um, I would put her at um, I would put her at chronic risk for suicide uh, because of that. Now, where would you start with Jane? 
You know, if she was to present with you, present to you with all of these things, and you know, she's working with you, where would you start? What would you kind of approach first in here? Relapse prevention, great. Ask her what the first thing is. Excellent, fantastic. Medications, stabilize basic needs, crisis intervention. Okay. Has something happened recently to make you think of suicide? Okay. Housing. Right. So lots of things that you can kind of do to support her, right? There's, there's not just one thing in this situation um, that might help her. And all of those, all of the ideas you have are fantastic. They're all things that would, would help her, right? So depending on which area you work in and what your role is, it might guide where you focus. Um, so, you know, the first things we kind of want to do are, are the most imminent, right? So we want to assess whether or not she's at risk. Um, so once we've concluded that she is not at imminent risk of suicide, um, we need to figure out where she is in that risk. So if we know chronic, but is she mild, moderate, severe, like where is she at the moment? And that, that's going to tailor where we go, right? So if she's a mild risk at the moment, so she has those thoughts, they're kind of passing, she can kind of get over it, she's got a really hopeful outlook for her future, then we really want to focus on, okay, what is it that you would like to work on, Jane? What's the most important for you right now? What's going to help you get to a place where those thoughts are even less? What's going to help you get to a place where your mental health is a little more stable? So, you know, she might choose the housing. She might choose, you know, say that I, I really need to find my own place. Living in a shelter is, is not, not good for me at the moment. Um, or she might choose something else. She might choose that, you know, um, I'm having a lot of cravings. I'm having a lot of triggers. And I really want to focus on relapse prevention. So at that point, it's kind of asking her where she wants to focus. But first and foremost, we want to figure out where she is in terms of her suicide risk. Now, what further information do we, do we need? Now, we've kind of already talked a little bit about this. People have kind of mentioned, you know, things that um, they would want to ask her. So one of the things we've kind of mentioned is, you know, we really want to ask her more questions about the suicide risk. But in any of this, is there anything else that you might want to ask that might help you tailor your intervention to her or create a safety plan with her? Social support, excellent. Resources, do you have a plan? contact number. So it looks like the theme here is asking her about what support she actually has. Yeah. What's kept her safe? Fantastic. What was helpful or un unhelpful in previous attempts? Okay. Barriers. Access to her meds. Okay. What's worked in the past? Fantastic. So the theme here is, you know, asking her what resources she has available to her and asking her what's worked in the past, what's stopping you. So we're focusing on her resilience now um, is what we're doing here. We're, we're kind of identifying what are your strengths and how can we use those strengths to create a plan that's going to help you. And that's absolutely, absolutely the case. So we want to identify where Jane is, what are the, the, what are the reasons that are bringing her to you, what are the reasons that have brought her to her recovery. Because She's been absent for a month. What happened in that last month? You know, was there a recent accidental overdose that kind of triggered her to say, okay, you know what, it's time to get some help? Um, you know, was it something else? Was it the fact that, you know, she connected with a family member or someone who is a positive influence in her life? Um, so we want, to, we want to get more information about what her strengths are. Now, what are some challenges that we have with Jane here? I'll go back to this just so uh, people can take a look. But, you know, she's a complex client. She's got a lot going on. What would be challenging about working with her? Does she trust you? Lack of permanent housing? Borderline personality disorder? Mm -hmm. that, that definitely adds complexity. Overdose. Unstable housing. Risk of using. Tendency to disengage. Okay, so we're worried that we're going to start working with her and she's going to disengage, um, and then we're going to kind of have things left undone. She might have had bad experiences with mental health professionals in the past. Interesting, okay. Seems transient. Support on and off. 
self-harm and substance use, early in her recovery. Right. So all, all, absolutely, all of those things add to the complexity that is Jane. Um, so there's a lot of things that are outside of her, our control in this case, right? We, we might not be, if we're not a housing worker, we might not be able to help her find housing. Um, you know, and if we're not specializing in addictions, we may not be able to help her with that relapse prevention piece. So there's lots of little things that we might not be the right person to support her with. Um, but that being the case, you know, we want to connect her to resources where that, that could be true. So regardless of this, I mean, this is a pur purposely complex client that I've brought up as a case um, based on actually a real client. So, um, you know, these, these kind of things do come up. Every client we have is going to have some complexity to it. And that's why we're, you know, we're the professionals working in this field is, is we're the ones who can kind of identify where are our strengths working with this client and where do we need to find someone else who has a strength working with this client. Now, what are things we would do to minimize her risk? So here comes our role, right? She's presenting to us um, with all of these multiple risk factors. What are some things we would do to minimize her risk? You know, we want to bring her from, let's say, you know, a, a moderate suicide risk to a mild. Um, how would we go about doing that? Limit access to means. Okay, so, so things that she might use to harm herself, we want to limit her access to. Create a safety plan with the network she's comfortable with. Provide her with 24-hour crisis lines. That's an excellent one. Discuss you, tools used in the past, create a plan with her, crisis lines, naloxone kit, that's, that's a really, really great one. Strengthen her sense of feeling secure, okay. Stabilizing meds. Mm -hmm. Wrap around support, perfect. So lots of things we can do to minimize her risk, right? Um, there's lots of areas where we can kind of intervene um, to help her reduce her risk. Um, a great one is providing her education about, about you know, medications and um, substances as well. So um, as we know, people who are abstinent for a period of time from substances have a higher risk of overdose if and when they do relapse um, because their tolerance has changed. So, um, you know, she might have been using a certain amount of heroin um, before she had this um, abstinence. And if she does relapse and she goes back to using the amount she was using before her relapse or before her abstinence, she may be at risk of opiate overdose. So we want to provide her with that information so that should she ever relapse, she knows um, to, you know, watch out for how much she's using, have a naloxone kit handy, use with someone else there so that she's in a bit of a safer environment. Um, we want to provide her with education about minimizing her risk in situations where, you know, she's not with us. Because let's be real, with our clients, they're with us for possibly an hour. We have a very short amount of time where we're working with them, and the rest of their life is spent away from us. So we're not there to kind of talk them through all of these situations. Um, our role is to help them build up the, the resources they need so that when they're in those situations, they can kind of work through them and keep themselves safe. Um, but again, that's the responsibility. we have that sense of responsibility as, as care providers. We feel like, you know, it's our job to make this person safe. Um, and while, you know, sure, there's some truth to that, at the end of the day, it's the client who has to do the work in order to keep themselves safe. So we just want to do what we can in order to provide them with the resources that they need. Um, and then interventions and safety plan. What are some things that we might want to include in uh, a safety plan for Jane? So again, some of the stuff we've talked about, so you know, talking to her about her opiate use, having medication compliance as part of it, um, improving her access to housing, shelter, suicide health numbers, uh, providing her with crisis lines so that again, when we're not with her, she still has resources in order to keep herself safe, access support when she needs it. Check in with the shelter worker in a lock zone kit. Perfect. Calling. Yeah. yeah. A great one, too, is, is scheduling follow-ups, you know, with you as well. So instead of just kind of seeing her once and saying, like, okay, we're done, saying, like, is it okay if we check in in, in a couple weeks, see how things are going, if there's anything else I can help you with, right? Perfect. Okay. So 
a lot of the stuff we've kind of gone through, but some of the things we want to do with Jane is identify what her areas of resilience and strength are. So what were the times when Jane wanted to harm herself but was able to keep herself safe? And this did come up in, in the chat there. Um, and what did she do to accomplish this? So, you know, Jane, tell me about moments when, you know, you were having those suicidal thoughts and, you know, you really wanted to act on them, but something changed your mind. What was that? What, what was it about that situation that kept you safe? Um, you know, what did you do to keep yourself safe? Who was there with you? Who was your support? Figuring that out so that when you create a new safety plan for her, um, that can be included in it because it's something that's tried and true. It's something that's worked for her. Um, and then being open about the potential risks. We don't want to um, be deceptive in any way with, with any client. Um, especially when it comes to, to risk of suicide. So we want to discuss the risk of substance use as a coping mechanism. So she has PTSD, asking her, you know, does the substance use help you cope with symptoms of your PTSD? Because that identifies what her needs are. Um, and then what she needs in order to use adaptive coping strategies. So she may know, you know, instead of using, um, I need to call a friend. But what prevents her from doing that? What is it that leads her towards using instead of calling her friend? Um, so, you know, having that discussion with her, identifying what it is that she feels she needs in order to use the coping strategies. It's really led by her. Um, we can offer the, the expertise in terms of, of resources and support, uh, but at the end of the day, she's the person who the plan is catered to, and she's the person the plan has to work for. So she's the person who needs to create that plan. We're just there to support her. Um, and that goes on for her reasons for living and continuing to work on recovery. So why is she here now? What's different now? What's, you know, what are the motivators and the drivers for her recovery and what's gonna keep her going? Um, we wanna explore those and highlight those for her, get her to um, tell us those and make them really concrete for her as well. Um, and then again, she should be the safety, the driver for her safety plan, but not identifying what she needs. She needs to be able to do that on her own. And then be honest with what you can and cannot help her with. We all have limitations to what we can do and can't do in our, in our, in our settings. Um, and we need to be honest with her. You know, we can't promise her that, oh yeah, you know, let me help you with housing if that's not what we're specialized in, if that's not what we have resources to do. At that point, we just need to connect her to the supports that are available to her um, and make that transition as seamless as possible so that she has less jumping around to do between services. Um, and that comes down to you know, communicating within, within care providers, which we're not always the greatest at. Um, so something we can improve in, in these situations. Um, I'm seeing here people mentioning hope, which is fantastic. Um, hope uh, is a really big one, right? And it comes into identifying her resilience um, and, and areas of strength is, is what gives her hope um, and what keeps her going. So what's kept her here? That's all great. Now, the other thing we want to keep in mind is there is a lot of complexity to suicide. Um, you know, the, the reasons people have suicidal ideations and then act on thoughts of suicide are complex. So it's not just down to substance use. Um, you know, there's a lot of other things that come into play when someone is contemplating ending their life. Um, and we need to be familiar with the risk factors and warning signs that are kind of at play in terms of, um, you know, not only substance use, but as a whole for that person as a human in the environment with, you know, family and society, their work, um, all of those things come into play. So we need to identify where the risk factors are. And if you're ever in doubt, if you don't know something, just ask that person. We tend to be afraid of asking questions when we don't really want to know the answers or when we're worried that the answer is going to be something that we don't know what to do with, um, which we kind of talked about earlier with the anxiety. But it's better to ask and have that answer so that there is something to go off of. So that, you know, if something does happen to that person, then we kind of have something to go off of. Um, now you can see here, you know, things like um, what their vulnerabilities are, how hopeless or helpless they're feeling, all of those things come into play here. And research suggests up to 90% of people who uh, actually complete suicide have some form of mental health challenge or addiction. And I bring that stat up to say, you know, th this whole talk is kind of about substance use and suicide risk. But at the end of the day, all of the people we're working with who present with suicide risk have things in their life that are causing them to get to this point. There's reasons they're feeling hopeless and helpless and feel like ending their life might be the only option for them. And mental health and addictions, kind of, we all 
to some degree deal with some form of mental health or addiction. So, you know, that, that anxiety about working with people who have substance use is kind of our anxiety with not knowing what to do with it. But I think it's, it's kind of helpful to, to understand that most people we're working with have some form of it. And as long as we're trying to help, we're doing something. So um, the other thing I want to mention is if the person you're assessing is intoxicated at the time you're assessing them, which might be the case depending on, on which situation you're in, which setting you're in, you may want to wait for them to sober up before continuing with, you know, talking about a safety plan and assessing their level of risk and, um, well, not necessarily assessing their level of risk, but um, figuring out what you want your safety plan and intervention to be because at that point, their impulsivity, their, you know, ability to kind of comprehend what's going on might be impaired. Um, so it's not necessarily the best time to work with them. So um, definitely that's a good situation where you want to set a follow-up, figure out a plan where they can go somewhere safe in order to sober up, um, and then continue your assessment from there. All right. Um, so the other thing we want to do is be really con concrete with our safety plan. So um, we don't want to leave it kind of vague about like, you know, um, is there someone you can turn to? And the person says, oh, I'll call a friend. Um, that's great. We want to assess who is that friend. Are they available, you know, at certain times of the day? If that person's not available, who is it that you can call? Being really concrete about a safety plan because when a person is in that state of mind where they're feeling extremely distressed, they're probably not going to be able to follow those steps very carefully. So it has to be laid out very plainly and very concretely for them to be able to follow it. And the plan has to be appropriate to their level of risk. So if the person is at severe risk, then we don't want to create a plan that's for someone who is at mild risk. It's not appropriate for them. It's not going to help them. And vice versa is true. Um, although, you know, it's, it's nice to have a detailed plan. So it's always better to err on the side of caution, but we want to make sure that we're actually making a plan that's appropriate for that person so that when and if that situation arises, they can actually do something about it without us having to be there to kind of talk them through it. I've talked about this a lot, um, following up with the clients. So this is a really important one. People fall through the cracks, and we kind of heard this in terms of people's anxiety about you know, what makes it hard to work with a client like this. We're worried that they're going to disengage. We're worried that we're going to kind of lose them, and then what, right? If they present with the risk of suicide, and then all of a sudden, poof, they're gone, what do we actually do with that? So, you know, telling the client, like, I like to follow up with people. I just want to make sure that we've kind of covered everything, that we've covered all our bases. I want to check in with you. Um, is that okay if we do that? You know, what's a good time for me to do that? Let's figure out a way we can make that happen. Follow up with clients because it's going to make you feel better knowing that that person's doing well, that they've been able to follow through with things. So it's going to help you assess whether or not the plan you made for them is actually working um, or if it needs tweaking. So following up is really important. And then the supports as well, you know, getting their consent to include family and friends if it's possible. Not all of our clients have this luxury where they have family or friends who are supportive. Um, you know, a lot of their, their system may be also involved in, in substance use. So it may be hard to include those people because they may be enabling rather than supporting them. So figuring out who the people are that they can include, and this could also include care providers, right? It doesn't have to be just family and friends. It's nice to have because family and friends are likely there for them in situations where care providers are not. Um, but, you know, if it's possible, it's great to do. Okay. And then I want to share some resources as well. So, you know, suicide risk can be a little tough if you're not used to doing it about, you know, what do, what do I need to ask? What are the questions I need to know? How do I even figure out if there, what's the difference between mild and moderate and how do I figure that out? Um, so here's a few resources that are really great in terms of, you know, specific questions about um, assessing what their level of risk is, whether they have access to means, whether they have a plan, what their intent is, how do you figure all of that out? Um, all of these resources are, are really great for that. Um, I believe the, the, one, uh, the second one there might be a little bit older, um, but it still has really great information about what questions you should be asking, what kind of things you should be looking for. And then if you haven't um, looked into um, ASSIST, it's actually a really great program um, where you learn you know, how, to, how to actually talk to someone um, who is expressing thoughts of suicide, um, how to intervene at that point. It's a really great training. They, kind of, they have them all over the place. So um, I would highly recommend it if you can attend um, an ASSIST training and, and have not done so. Um, I did it a while back, and it was 
absolutely phenomenal. So I highly, highly recommend that. Um, now let me see here. I believe that's all. So um, just a summary here of everything we've talked about. We know suicide is, is a significant public health concern and continues to be so. Uh, and substance use has a significant impact on suicidal ideation uh, attempts and, and deaths caused by suicide. And it's really important for us to screen for substance use as a risk factor for suicide, seeing all the stats that we've seen. Um, we know that it can significant, significantly increase the risk of suicide. Um, so we want to screen and make sure we're doing our due diligence to um, mitigate any risk that's, that's there. Um, and then the comprehensive safety plan should include uh, strategies to mitigate risk surrounding substance use. Um, so those are kind of the takeaways. Got some references here, and we'll move on to questions. And uh, Wayne is here as well if you have any questions about uh, any of the research pieces. Um, so I'm just going to go through here. Um, will these slides be made available? Yes, I believe they are made available to you at the end of uh, today's session. Smoking. What is the reference for the slide on smoking and suicide? I'm going to take a look here, Wayne. Oh, sure. Um, uh, go back. Sorry. There you go. Here, it's uh, it'll be in the reference. Uh, it'll be in the reference slide that you'll get a copy of after today. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, standardized standardized risk assessment tools. There's lots out there. Um, you know, the they kind of all focus around figuring out whether the client has ideation, whether they have a plan, and whether they have an intent. Um, also, looking at past attempts. Uh, we want to look at any family history. We know that can also increase their, their risk. And then identifying what their risk factors are. So, um, you know, things we know like age, as uh, Wayne mentioned, is a risk factor, substance use, increasing hopelessness, agitation, um, trauma, all of those things kind of increase people's risk of suicide. So a standardized assessment tool uh, for suicide usually asks for all of those things and, and um, you know, it's kind of meant to explore those, those factors. Is contracting for safety an effective practice worth practicing? Absolutely. Um, we always want to um, see what it is that gives the client hope and what it is that makes them feel safe. So, you know, research kind of shows contracting for safety isn't a fail-safe. So someone can say to you, yes, 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 I'm going to do all these things. This is great. And, you know, if I'm having these thoughts, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to harm myself. At the end of the day, it's the person who has to make that effort to do those things. And they can tell you that they're going to do them, but at the end of the day, not do them. And that is that is fully their choice. That is their autonomy. Um, so, you know, if, if contracting for safety is something you want to do, I don't see the harm in doing that. Um, but just, you know, do it knowing that, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that the client is absolutely going to do those things, and that's not up to you to force them to do those things. What about someone who says smoking is the highlight of life? It's interesting. It's a good thing to explore if they say that, right? What makes it a highlight? What is it? What purpose is it kind of serving in your life that makes it so pleasurable for you? Um, so we want to assess. We don't want to shy away from the things that make something pleasurable for them. But on the same hand, we still want to explore, like, you know, there's a lot of great benefits it sounds like you're getting out of smoking. Now, is there anything that you feel like is not so great about smoking? Right? We want to explore that side, too. What is the biggest obstacle in creating a more comprehensive treatment model? Ooh, that's a good question. I think there's lots of obstacles. Um, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question. Um, I think we're all, we call it, kind of all have our own specialties. Um, and we tend to work in silos a lot. Um, I think communication isn't always the greatest in between care providers, so I think that's what makes it a little bit harder, is that um, the person might be receiving care from, from multiple areas, and, and the treatment plan might not be the same for all of them, and they might not be communicated. So um, I think that that kind of can make it a little bit more difficult, if that kind of answers the question. When the client is living in the community, what are some useful strategies for reducing access to means? Um, again, now, we can talk to the client about how they can do that, right? Ask them, like, you know, I've noticed 
you know, your past attempts have been um, by cutting. Is there any way you're willing to remove those items from your home or make them harder for you to access? Just asking them what is it that they feel that they can do that will help them minimize that risk? Because again, like, you know, we can't go into their home and remove all their knives. That's just, it's not gonna happen, it's not realistic. Um, so we need to leave some autonomy to that person. We need to believe that there is a part of them that wants to be here um, that's gonna work with us and, and figure out ways that they can keep themselves safe. You wanna answer this one? Uh, which one is it? Oh, is there a dose risk dose risk relationship between chronic cannabis use and risk of suicide? Uh, not that I could find. I wasn't able to find a dose response relationship between the two, um, but that might be something to look on uh, further, especially with the legalization of um, cannabis in Canada. Yeah, but I haven't been able to find one. Is there a point uh, we notify include the primary care provider if the patient hasn't consented? Um, now, that one is kind of, it's difficult. I mean, you may want to discuss that within your team, what your practices are. Um, I think if the client, typically my approach is discussing with the client, you know, what my, my obligations are in terms of duty to warn, duty to report. Um, and I typically have that conversation with, um, you know, the client about, you know, if there is any imminent risk, you, your primary provider may want to know. It might be helpful for them to know so that if they're prescribing you any medications, all of that can be reviewed. Um, so that one's a little bit tougher. I would encourage you to have that conversation with the client and explain what the importance is in sharing that information. At the end of the day, if they don't consent, then you don't have their consent. Um, but, you know, we, we want to try and get their consent for that if we can because it's, it's helpful to have, again, that collaborative approach to that person's care. What happened to the patient in the case? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I mean, she's, she's safe and well as far as I know, <laughs> so she's doing quite well. When does risk trump privacy? So anytime the person is at imminent risk of harm to themselves or others, um, we are legally obligated to report that. So if the person says, yes, I have, um, I'm having thoughts of suicide, I have a plan, I have an intent, as soon as I leave here, I'm going to go home and I'm going to hurt myself, that trumps their privacy 100%. So anytime we're worried that this person is actually going to follow through with, with uh, an attempt or a plan, um, then we need to contact uh, the proper authorities to make sure that that person is safe. Are there any support groups for individuals who are suicidal? It's, I mean, worth looking in. I'm sure a Google search can turn up anything that's kind of in your area. Um, family support. What are the proper authorities? So um, it depends where you are, right? So if they're um, with you in the clinic or, you know, where you might be, it's um, you might be able to take them to the eMERGE if, if that's um, easier for you. You may have to call the police um, to get that person to uh, the emergency department as well. Um, a, a physician can put them on a Form 1 in order to get them admitted if they are an imminent risk of harm to themselves or others. So um, 911 is a good call if um, they have left you or that they will not agree to go with you uh, to the emergency. A teen who's using substances, they're often very quiet and shy. Can you suggest ways to open a dialogue on a difficult client? Sure, I think, um, I think our relationship with the clients are really important. So as long as that person feels comfortable and like you're not going to judge them or, you know, especially with teens, I think it's very, very um, difficult because there is a sense that they're going to be told that what they're doing is wrong and that they should stop and we focus on all the negatives. Um, but really de developing a good relationship with someone does wonders for them opening up to us um, and feeling more comfortable with us about, you know, the difficult things that are going on in their life. And I think that's true for all of us, not just teens, but possibly teens a little bit more because they can be a little more secretive about substance use.
what do you do when the emergency department kicks them out after 12 hours? That's a tough one. Um, I think follow-ups are important in that case. We want to make sure that the client is safe. Um, you know, it is, it is the hospital's responsibility if they have someone who presents with suicidal ideation to do a thorough risk assessment and make sure that person is safe when they leave. Um, I have sent people back, um, you know, to the hospital if I felt like they weren't safe and advocated for them by calling them. Um, so, I mean, there's only so much I can do again, and I, I, I try not to take responsibility for other people's um, actions, um, which can be really tough in a situation like this, but advocating for our clients is really important in situations where we feel like they need that extra support. Expressing why we feel like they need that, I think, goes a long way. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Wayne and Huma, for that very educational and informative webinar. And thank you to everyone who participated in the chat box. It was very engaging and interactive. So thank you. I'll just go to the end here. So again, um, this webinar has been recorded. And a link to the recording, as well as a copy of the slides, will be emailed to you this afternoon. And the evaluation and post-learning assessment will also be sent, and you will have one week to complete this if you would like to receive a letter of completion. And if you participated as a group, please make sure that you do email teacherkamh.ca with a complete list of participants by 2 p.m. Unfortunately, we cannot uh, sift through the chat box to uh, look at attendees, so please make sure that you email teach. Our next Teach Educational Rounds is an approach to treating women with alcohol and tobacco use disorders during pregnancy and lactation. And that will be presented by Dr. Alice Ordeen on September 4th. And registration is opened. I will send this link in the email as well. And again, if you missed today's presentation, you would like to view it again, or you are interested in seeing previous Teach webinars, a link to our archived webinars is found on our website. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your week.